Good morning. We have a very special guest speaker here today, but, um, and Kunchuk's going to introduce her in a few moments, but I want to say why she's here. We have a series of endowed funds at the Taft School, and she's here today largely because of the generosity of the, of the Paley family endowed fund established in 2006 by Valerie and Jeffrey Paley, class of 56, it supports the Paley lectures, an annual program of visiting speakers, invited speakers to address the school community on current issues of major significance, such as government, journalism, foreign affairs, environment, and civil liberties. In order to provide all of you with the opportunity to be inspired by the value and dignity of lives filled with purpose and commitment. I'm going to invite uh, Kunchuk to come up. Sarah Burns is the author of The Central Park Five, A Chronicle of a City Wilding. And along with David McMahon and Ken Burns, the producer, writer, and director of the documentary The Central Park Five, about five black and Latino teenagers who were wrongly convicted in the infamous Central Park, Central Park jogger rape of 1989. The film premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 2012 and was named the best nonfiction film of 2012 by the New York Film Critics Circle and won a 2013 Peabody Award. Most recently, she, pro she produced and directed, along with David McMahon and Ken Burns, the two-part four-hour Jackie Robinson, a biography of the celebrated baseball player and civil rights icon, which she wrote with McMahon. The film will air on PBS in April, the film aired April 2016. She is currently working on a documentary about public housing in Atlanta, in Atlanta. Sarah was born and raised in Walpole, New Hampshire. She graduated from Yale University with a degree in American Studies and now lives in Brooklyn, New York with her husband, David McMahon, and their children. Ms. Burns will be in the faculty room for a Q&A session following this morning meeting and in East Dining Hall for a D block lunch. Thank you. Please join me in warmly welcoming Ms. Burns. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to Taft to talk about my work and how I came to the story of the Central Park Five. I spent over a decade of my life telling the story of these wrongful convictions of five black and Latino teenagers for the rape of a white woman in Central Park in 1989, first in an undergraduate paper, then in a narrative nonfiction book, and then in a documentary film. Um, some of you may be familiar with this story also from a mini-series on Netflix by Ava DuVernay called When They See Us, it was sort of a more recent telling of this case. Um, for those of you who don't know the story, I'll give a brief explanation. In April 1989, an investment banker named Tricia Miley was attacked while jogging in Central Park. A man named Matias Reyes brutally beat and raped her fracturing her skull and leaving her for dead in a secluded area of the park. That same evening, a group of 25 to 30 teenagers from Harlem went into the park. Some in the group harassed joggers and bicyclists. Two men were physically assaulted. One spent a couple of nights in the hospital. Some of the kids were rounded up that night by the police. But when the joggers' nearly lifeless body was found early the next morning, what would have been a trip to family court or um, a, a brief matter um, became something else entirely. Seasoned homicide detectives were brought in and began interrogating the teenagers who'd been in the park. They immediately assumed that these kids were responsible for the rape. Some of the teenagers, among them, had been in trouble before or who had, had family members who knew something of the justice system, and they knew better how to advocate for themselves. Some invoked their right to remain silent and ended up in family court or with brief sentences for minor crimes. But as the hours and days wore on, the police fixated on five teenagers who hadn't been in trouble before. Their names are Corey Wise, Raymond Santana, Yusef Salam, Kevin Richardson, and Antron McRae. The thing about police interrogations is that the whole point is to get a confession. By the time an interrogation starts, the police already believe they have the guilty party in front of them. So they're not interested in learning new facts or investigating the truthfulness of a denial. 
there are few restrictions on what police can do or say in an interrogation, even with juveniles. Anyone under 16 is supposed to have a guardian present, but in many cases, the family members were manipulated or kept out of the room so that they couldn't effectively advocate for their kids. Police are also not allowed to physically harm a suspect or to make explicit or implicit threats or promises, but who can hope to prove it when they do these things? Judges and juries have historically been unlikely to believe a criminal suspect over a police officer, especially, unfortunately, when that suspect is a black teenager. And lying to a suspect is allowed, even encouraged. The detectives who were interrogating them used what's known as the Reed Technique, which includes a version of what we see on police procedural dramas, except that in reality it's bad cop, then good cop. At first the kids didn't understand what was happening or what they were even being accused of, but then the detectives began to get angry at them, yelling, blowing smoke in their faces, refusing to listen to their denials. The detectives told these kids that others had implicated them, that they would be going to jail for years, what it would be like for them in jail. The interrogations lasted hours without food or sleep. Finally, when they were hopeless and afraid, the good cop would provide them with what looked like a way out. I know you're a good kid, they would say. We just need your help. You can be a witness. Detectives told them that they would be able to go home if they provided statements, told them what they wanted to hear. That was against the rules because it constituted a promise. But again, who was going to enforce that? Eventually, they cracked. Youssef Salam started talking to a detective, but his mother interrupted before he could sign a written statement, though the detective's notes would later be introduced as evidence against him anyway. Antron McRae, Kevin Richardson, Raymond Santana, and Corey Wise all signed written statements and gave videotape statements that placed them at the scene or as peripheral participants in the rape. Corey Wise gave four different statements, two written and two videotaped, because each of his statements was different and the police were trying to get his story to hold together. The police quickly reported these confessions to the media, which had a field day. The teenagers were described as a wolf pack and savage, their activities called wilding. Rarely, if ever, was the word alleged used to describe them. In two separate trials in 1990, the five teenagers were tried and found guilty. Though their statements disagreed with the facts of the case, with the other statements, and even within themselves. DNA testing, a brand new technology at the time, had already shown that the sample taken at the crime scene did not match any of the teenagers who had been in the park that night. And yet they were convicted. They were 14, 15, and 16 years old. Corey Wise, the eldest, was not limited by juvenile sentencing restrictions. So while the younger four were sentenced to the maximum for juveniles, five to 10 years, Corey received a sentence of five to 15 years in prison. And he was sent immediately to maximum security adult facilities, though with learning disabilities and likely undiagnosed hearing loss and developmental delays, he was woefully ill-equipped to handle it. In 2001, when each of the five had served their complete sentences except for Corey, who was now in the final year of his prison term, a fellow inmate named Matthias Reyes approached Corey in the prison yard at Auburn Correctional Facility in upstate New York. Back in 1989, they'd both been in jail at Rikers Island in New York City awaiting trial and they'd gotten into a fight over the TV channel in the day room. That day in the yard in 2001, Reyes approached Corey and apologized for their altercation years earlier, and they had a friendly conversation. In the following weeks, Reyes, who was there serving a life sentence for a series of other rapes he'd committed back in 1989, came forward and confessed that he was the one who raped the Central Park jogger and that he had done it alone. The New York City District Attorney's Office confirmed that Reyes's DNA matched the sample that had been found on the victim's clothes, and then they launched a thorough reinvestigation. They concluded that these five men were clearly innocent of the rape, 
though they would not go so far as implicating the police in the coerced confessions that had most certainly contributed to the convictions. The police, meanwhile, undertook their own investigation, which unsurprisingly cleared them of all wrongdoing by theorizing without any evidence that the five teenagers must have participated in some way, perhaps alongside Reyes or before or after his attack. Nonetheless, in December 2002, a judge vacated their convictions. Supporters of the men began calling them the Central Park Five. The following year, they filed federal civil rights lawsuits against the city of New York and the police and prosecutors who had been involved in the case. When that crime took place in April of 1989, I was too young to have followed it or even known about it. I wasn't aware. It wasn't until 2003 when I was working for one of those lawyers, a civil rights lawyer, who was drafting the complaint in the civil suit on behalf of the Central Park Five that I first learned about the case. I was heading into my senior year in college and trying to decide if I wanted to go to law school. But the miscarriage of justice in this case struck me and stuck with me. I was surprised, naively so, and also angered that something this unjust could happen. I returned to school and wrote my senior essay about the case, focusing on the racialized media representations of the Central Park Five. I studied the four daily papers in New York City from that time, tracing the animal characterizations that were used to describe these teenagers and unpacking the context for the use of this language. I wrote about how using animal terms to describe African Americans, how it had risen out of a post-slavery attempt at maintaining control over a newly emancipated black population by dehumanizing them and creating fear. The painting of black men especially as savage and animalistic was an excuse to justify violent means of control, which often came in the form of lynching. Here's how an 1892 article in the Memphis Daily Commercial attempted to portray and justify the grounds for that extra legal form of murder. I quote, Southern barbarism plays upon, preys upon weak and defenseless women, the article claimed. Nothing but the most prompt, speedy, and extreme punishment can hold in check the horrible and bestial propensities of the Negro race. I was struck by how similar the reaction was in the Central Park Jogger case to this language from a century earlier. Another example, the Scottsboro Boys, a group of nine black teenagers who were falsely charged with rape in 1931 in Alabama, were described by one newspaper as beasts unfit to be human. In 1989, just 30 years ago, the Central Park Five were described as a wolf pack, savages, bloodthirsty, brutal, bestial, and mutant and their actions were called wilding. And then there was Donald Trump calling for the return of the death penalty. He placed a full page ad in the four daily papers in New York, spent $85,000. The ad said, bring back the death penalty, bring back our police. <clears throat> His ad was directly responding to the Central Park jogger rape, and yet this was not a murder, Though the jogger had been near death, she survived and made a miraculous recovery. And the suspects were children on both fronts, making this case ineligible for the death penalty, even if it had been the law in New York at the time. He was, in effect, calling for a lynching. He was not alone. Political commentator Pat Buchanan wrote an op-ed in the New York Post suggesting what should happen to these children long before any trial had taken place. If the eldest of that wolf pack were tried, convicted, and hanged in Central Park, he wrote, and the 13 and 14 year olds were stripped, horsewhipped, and sent to prison, the park might soon be safe again for women. This was in my lifetime. After writing my senior paper, focusing on the racism in the media coverage of the case, I felt that there was much more to the story of the Central Park Five. I decided that instead of going to law school, I was gonna expand this project and write a book. I hadn't aspired to be an author, but I had become too passionate about this story, one that still felt untold and unknown, to let go of it. <clears throat> 
Writing the book gave me more space to consider not only the racism in the media coverage of the case, but other factors that contributed to these wrongful convictions, coercive police interrogation tactics, how they lead to false confessions, the high crime rates and very racialized fears of New Yorkers that had made it so easy to assume the worst about these teenagers of color, the racial tension in the city that had exploded earlier in the 1980s and violent incidents from the subway vigilante and murders in Howard Beach um, and expressions of police violence, and the aggressive tactics of the police and prosecutors, including perjury during the criminal trials. For me, documentary filmmaking is the family business. My parents started making documentaries when they were in college. My uncle is a documentarian as well. I met my husband when he was working for my dad's company as an intern on a series on the history of jazz. It was obvious to us that this story, the story of the Central Park Five, deserved telling, needed telling in this form. I had initially stayed away from the family business, from filmmaking. I didn't want to go into it just because I could, just because it was there. But now there was the story of injustice that I cared deeply about telling, and documentaries seemed the ideal way to share it and spread it more widely. My book came out in 2011, followed by the documentary, which I made with my husband and father in 2012. We wanted to tell the truth of a story that had never been properly told before. As with the book, we wanted to explore how these wrongful convictions had happened and what we might do to prevent similar injustices in the future. But more than anything, we wanted to give these five men a chance to tell their story in their own words, to try to restore some of the dignity that was taken from them in the initial rush to judgment and the media coverage that had so dehumanized them. Now I want to show you a brief clip from the film. It's about the public reaction to the police's announcement that a group of teenagers from Harlem had confessed to this heinous crime and some of the historical context I was just talking about for that response. Can we roll the clip, please? In the first few days after the incident, the narrative that came out was that these young men were guilty. And it was almost unquestioned. When parents or grandmothers uh, of some of these uh, alleged uh, perpetrators, we always have to say alleged because that's the requirement. When those grandmothers say, but he's a good boy. He never did anything. Don't you believe it? It was so much hate. Don't you believe it? We couldn't watch TV. There's something wrong with the parenting and the families and the home life of our city. It's an outrage. It's, it's the violence in this city, the quality of life in this city is getting worse and worse. This is, is the, the ultimate shriek of alarm. This is the ultimate siren that says none of us is safe. The story has enraged many New Yorkers, startled others, and started renewed talk of an under-policed city with crime out of control. Mayor Koch said, this will be a test of the system. People want to see how the uh, criminal justice system works, or if it works. The brutal attack on the young investment banker is fueling a new battle for the death penalty. Even though, as the proposed law now stands, it would only apply to those 18 or older. I'm for the death penalty. If someone were to hurt my family or a loved one as they did this woman, I would probably want them dead. You better believe that I hate the people that took this girl and raped her brutally. You better believe it. Trump put his money where his mouth is by taking out this full page ad in four New York City newspapers. Bring back the death penalty. Trump's ads underscore a fierce debate going on right now in New York. According to a recent Gallup poll, a full 76% of all New York City residents favor executing some convicted criminals. There were children. There were children. Bringing up the death penalty in the context of a case in which you were discussing children was outrageous to me. I think that if she had been a young woman who uh, who had been found in an alley in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, if she had been found uh, in Harlem, 
if she had been found in any of the any of the uh, uh, darker enclaves in this city or in this state, Donald Trump wouldn't have spoken. He he wouldn't have even whispered a word. Interracial rapes are covered differently. And there was another major rape in the city at the time. And this is the woman who was raped in Brooklyn and thrown off a rooftop that got little to no coverage because the assailants and the victim were in the same racial group. If there's a white woman and the accusation is that she's been done in by blacks, that by itself takes you back to Emmett Till, who did nothing but whistle at a woman and ended up in a shallow Mississippi grave. If this had happened in uh, 1901, they would have been lynched, perhaps castrated, and their bodies burned. And that would have been the end of it. But this was New York City, 1989. It was not Jim Crow South. And yet the same words are being used with the same damaging results. They seized on the fears of the people wilding the bestial characterization of the black man, these young hoodlums, these thugs. Once we were on the path to identifying these young men as the culprits, it, it's hard to get off that path. And race-powered politics make it extremely difficult. Um, it requires extraordinary courage. A lot of people in the black community went along with the confessions. Many of us were frightened by our own children. Many of us had been pushed around, raped, burglarized, pocketbook snatched, harassed on the subway, often by young black men. People just said, oh, how terrible. How terrible. And everyone turned against him except a few. So, what is our role as filmmakers to address the injustice we see in this case? Are we storytellers, journalists, advocates? That question arose for us when the city of New York, in defending the civil lawsuit filed by the Central Park Five, subpoenaed us, the filmmakers, in 2012, just as our film was about to be released. They demanded our interviews, our research, basically everything we'd gathered in making the film. In fighting the subpoena, we had to prove that we are journalists and that we ought to be protected by the shield laws for journalists. And we did. We won the case. But their briefs made clear that for some there is an expectation that journalists can't have a point of view. They argued that somehow I was not a journalist because I came to a conclusion about the innocence of the Central Park Five. It's ridiculous. Everyone has a point of view. There is no such thing as objectivity. But I always approach the story by looking at the facts. But I also wanted to achieve something by telling a story. At first, it was just about spreading the word of this terrible miscarriage of justice and how it had happened. But this case is also emblematic of the assumptions that we make about black and brown men and women, as we are so tragically and constantly reminded. While we were making the film, it was Trayvon Martin, who was the contemporary example of these terrible assumptions run amok. George Zimmerman found Trayvon Martin suspicious simply because of what he looked like and where he was, just as so many assumed the guilt of the Central Park Five. Since then, there have been many others assumed to be guilty or even killed by police because of the color of their skin. Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Walter Scott, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, and just last month, Tatiana Jefferson, among countless others. Their deaths remind us of the heartbreaking prevalence of these prejudices. But just as requiring police to wear body cameras won't solve the underlying racism that leads to police murders of black citizens, convincing police departments to record interrogations 
as we've always joined the Innocence Project and others in recommending, doesn't do anything to address the systemic racism that helps lead to wrongful convictions. The fact is that our justice system treats people of color, especially black people, differently. And that's the hardest and most frustrating part of telling a story like this. What can we do? When we would screen our film, people would often ask how they could help. And we could talk about recording custodial interrogations, and we could tell people that they could write the mayor and other elected officials about the case and the decade-long civil suit that at that time still hadn't settled. Well, it did finally settle in 2014, after our film was released, for $41 million. That's been wonderful for these five men and gives them some measure of closure, but they will never get back what they lost in their years of incarceration and in the damage it did to them and their families. But what about the next time it happens? What about the fact that so many people found it so easy to believe that they were guilty, even when there was overwhelming evidence pointing to their innocence? Even when their so-called confessions were inconsistent within themselves, with each other, and with the facts of the case, when DNA tests clearly excluded all of them? I have no doubt that a situation just like the Central Park Five case could happen and is happening again. So what can we do? As a storyteller, I can inform, try to set the record straight, but I also think that storytelling can help to create more empathy, to open people's eyes, to see those who are different from them as less different, to see that their white 14-year-old would be just as vulnerable to the police tactics that coerced the Central Park Five into giving those false statements to begin to understand the ways in which the system is rigged. Not everyone will come away from learning about the Central Park Five with the same feelings. We've gotten regular hate mail from one racist and paranoid individual who sent us dozens of anonymous notes accusing us, the filmmakers, of being dupes of the black criminals. But I've also seen how telling a compelling, truthful, and emotional story can have an impact on individuals. So many times, after screenings of the documentary at film festivals and theaters, we would be there with some of the Central Park Five, some of the men there, and someone in the audience would ask if any of the police or prosecutors had ever apologized to them. And we would have to report that not only had none of them apologized, but that those who have spoken publicly have continued to insist upon their guilt. But then, and this happened countless times, someone else in the audience would raise their hand and say, I don't have a question. I just wanted to make a statement. I read the papers back then, and I believed that you were guilty, and I just want to say, I'm sorry. At least for the Central Park Five, for Antron, Raymond, Corey, Youssef, and Kevin, there is some healing there. And it gives me a little hope that people are capable of changing their minds and perhaps their hearts. Thank you.